Hello, hello. How's it going? Welcome to another fun filled book date. We're going to go into our fantasy today and we are going to be reading Wildwood. This has been on my list for a while, but I still haven't read it. So this is going to be new to you as it's new to me, but every time I pick it up, it still looks interesting. So Prue McKeel's life is ordinary, that is, until her brother is abducted by a murder of crows taken into the impassable wilderness, a dense, tangled forest on the edge of Portland. Now, I don't know if this is Portland, Oregon or Portland, Maine. I might have made that mistake, but we'll find out. All right, so begins the adventure that will take Prue and her friend Curtis deep into the impassable wilderness. There, they will uncover a secret world in the midst of violent upheaval in a world full of warring creatures, peaceable, peaceable mystics, and powerful figures in the darkest with the darkest intentions. All right, I'm excited for this one. For Hank, of course. Chapter One, A Murder of Crows. How five crows managed to lift a 20 pound baby boy into the air was beyond Prue, but it was certainly the least of her worries. In fact, if she were to list her worries right then and there, as she sat, sat spellbound on the park bench and watched her little brother Mac carried aloft in talons with the five black crows, puzzling out just how this feat was likely to be done, would likely come in dead last. First on the list, her baby brother. Her responsibility was being abducted by birds. A close second, what did they plan on doing with him? And it had been such a nice day. True, it had been a little gray when Prue woke up that morning, but that September day in, was but what September day in Portland wasn't. She had drawn up the blinds in her bedroom and paused for a moment, taking in the sight of the tree branches outside her window framed as, it, as they were by a sky of dusty white-gray. In Saturday, It was Saturday, and the smell of coffee and breakfast was drifting up from downstairs. Her parents would be their normal Sunday positions, Dad with the nose in the paper, occasionally hefting a lukewarm mug of coffee to his lips, Mom peering through the tortoiseshell bifocals with a woolly mass of a knitting project of unknown determination. Her brother, all of one year old, would be sitting in his high chair, exploring the farthest frontiers in untangible babble. Deuce! Deuce! Sure enough, her vision was proven correct when she came downstairs to the nook of the kitchen. Her father mumbled a greeting, her mother's eyes smiled above her glasses, and her brother shrieked, Poo! Prue made herself a bowl of granola. I've got bacon on, darling! as her mother, returning attention to the amoeba of yarn in her hands. Was it a sweater? A tea cozy? A noose? Mother, Prue had said, now pouring rice milk over her cereal. I told you, I'm a vegetarian. Ergo, no bacon. She had read that the word ergo in, in a novel she had been reading. It was the first time she had used it. She wasn't sure if she used it right, but it felt good. So she sat down at a kitchen table and winked at Mac. Her father briefly peered over the top of his paper to give her a smile. What's on the docket today? Said her father. Remember, you're watching Mac. Mm, I don't know, Prue responded. Figured we'd hang around somewhere, rough up some old ladies, maybe stick up a hardware store, pawn, pawn the loot. Beats going to the crafts fair. Her father snorted. Don't forget to drop off the library books. They're in the basket at the front door, said her mother, knitting needles still clacking. We should be back for dinner, but you know how long these things can run. Gotcha, said Prue. Max shouted, shouted hoo, wild, and wildly brandished a spoon and sneezed. We think your brother might have a cold, said her father. So make sure he's bundled up, whatever you do. The crows lifted her brother higher into the overcast sky, and suddenly Prue became enamored with another worried. But he might have a cold. That had been their morning, truly an unremarkable one. 
proof in her granola, skimmed the comics, helped her dad ink a few gimmies for his crossword puzzle, and was off to hook up a red radio flyer wagon to the back of her single speed bike. And even the gray coat of gray reminded in the sky, but it didn't threaten rain. So Prue stuck Mac into a lined corduroy jumper, wrapped him in a satrum of quilted shints, and placed him, still babbling, into the wagon. She loosed one arm from the cocoon of clothing and handed him his favorite toy, a wooden snake, and he shook it appreciatively. Prue slipped on her black flats and toe clips and pedaled the bike in motion. The wagon bounced noisily behind her, Max shrieking happily with every jolt. They tore through the neighborhood tidy of clapboard houses, Prue nearly upsetting Max's wagon with every hurdled curb and missed rain puddle. The, ba- the bike's tires gave a satifi- satisfied shh as they carved through the wet pavement. The morning flew by, giving way to a warm afternoon, and after several errands, a pair of Levi's, not quite the right color, needed returning, a recent arrival bin of vinyl resting place required perusing, and a plate of veggie tostadas that was messily shared at the taqueria. She found herself why willing the time outside the coffee shop on the main street while Mac napped quietly in the red wagon. She sipped steamed milk and watched through the window as the cafe employees awkwardly installed a secondhand elk head trophy on the wall. Traffic hummed on Lombard Street, the first institutions of the neighborhood's polite rush hour. She a few passerbys cooed at the sleeping baby in the wagon, and Prue flashed them sarcastic smiles, a little annoyed to be someone's picture of sibling camaraderie. She doodled mindlessly in her sketchbook, a leaf-clogged gutter drain in front of the cafe, a hazy sketch of Matt's quiet face with an extra attention paid to the little dribble of snot emerging from his left nostril. The afternoon began to fade. Mac, waking, shook her from her trance. Right, she said putting her brother on her knee and rubbed his eyes. Let's keep moving. Library? Mac pouted, uncomprehending. Library it is, said Prue. She skidded to a halt in front of her, in front of the St. John's Branch Library, vaulted her bike to seat. Don't go anywhere, she said to Mac as she grabbed the short stack of books from the wagon. She jogged to the foyer, stood to the book's return slot, shuffling the in her hand, and stopped at one the Sibley Guide to Birds, inside. She had it for nearly three months now, braving overdue notices and threatening notes from the librarians before she finally consented to return it. Prue mournfully flipped through the pages of the book. She'd spent hours copying the beautiful illustrations of the books into her sketchbook, whispering their fantastic, exotic names like quiet incantation. The Western Tanager, the Whippoorwill, Box Swift, the names conjured the images of lofty climbs in faraway places, of quiet prairie dawns and misty treetop eras. Her gaze drifted from the book of darkness to return the slot and back. She winced and muttered, oh well, and shoved the book into her opening of her peacoat. She would brave the librarian's wrath for one more week. Outside, the old woman had stopped in front of the wagon and was busy searching around for its owner. Her bow, brow furrowed, Mac contentedly chewing on the head of his wooden snake. Prue rolled her eyes, took a deep breath, and threw open the doors of the library. When the woman saw Prue, she began to wave a knobby finger in her direction. Excuse me, miss. This is very unsafe to leave a child alone. Do, you, do his parents know where he's being cared for? What? Him? Asked Prue as she climbed back onto the bike. Poor thing. Doesn't have parents. I found him in the free book pile. She smiled wildly and pushed the bike away from the curb back to the street. The playground was empty when they arrived, and Prue enrolled Mac from his swaddling and set alongside the unhitched radio flyer. He was just beginning to walk and relish the opportunity to practice his balancing. He gurgled and smiled and played wa- and play- carefully waddled beside the wagon, pushing it slowly across the playground's asphalt. Knock yourself out, said Prue, when she pulled a copy of the Sibyl Guide to Birds from her coat, opening the dog-eared page about meadowlarks. 
The shadows against the blacktop were growing longer and the late afternoon gave way to early evening. That was when she first noticed the crows. At first, there were just a few, a wheeling concentric circles against the overcast sky. They caught Prue's attention, darting in their periphery, and she glanced up at them. Covius Bracalionis. She had been reading about them the night before. Even from a distance, Prue was astounded by the size and the power of their every wing stroke. A few more flew in a group, and there were now several wheeling and driving above the quiet playground. A flock, thought Prue, a swarm. She flipped through the pages of the Sibley and back to where there was an index of fanciful terms for groupings of birch, a sedge of herons, a fall of woodcock, and a murder of crows. She shivered, looked back up, and was startled to see that this murderers of crows had grown considerably. There were now dozens of birds, each a blackest pitch, piercing cold, empty holes into the widening sky. She looked at, over at Mac, who was now yards away, blithely toddling along the blacktop. She felt unnerved. Hey, Mac, she called. Where are you going? There were a sudden rush of wind and she looked up at the sky and was horrified to see the group of crows had grown twentyfold. The individual birds were now indiscernible from the mass, and the murder coalesced into a single, convulsive shape, blotting out the flat light of the afternoon sun. The shape swung and bowed in the air, and the noise of their beating wings and screeching cries made it almost deafening. Prue cast about, seeing if anyone else was witnessing this bizarre event but she was terrified to find she was alone. Then the crows dove. Their cry became a single unified scream as the clouds of crows fainted skyward before diving at a ferocious speed toward her baby brother. Mac gave a terrific squeal as the first crow reached him, snagging the hood of his jumper in a quick flourish of a talon. A second took hold of his sleeve, a third grabbing the shoulder, a fourth and a fifth touched down until the swarm surrounded and obscured the view of his body in a sea of flashing feathery blackness. And then, with seemingly perfect ease, Mac was lifted from the ground and into the air. Prue was paralyzed with shock and disbelief. How are they doing this? She found her legs and left, left them and felt them feel like they were cement. Her mouth was empty of anything that might draw forth words or a sound. Her entire placid, predictable life was now on the hinge of someone, of this one single event. Everything she'd ever felt or believed coming into terrible relief. Nothing her parents had told her, nothing she'd ever learned in school, could possibly prepare her for this one thing that was happening. Or really, what was to follow. Let my brother go! Waking from her reverie, Prue was now standing on the top of the bench, shaking her fists at the crows like an ineffectual, ineffectual comic book bystander, cursing some supervillain for the theft of a purse. Cur the crows were quickly gaining altitude and were now atop the highest branches of the, the poplars. Mac could barely be seen amid the black winged swarm. Prue jumped down on the bench and grabbed a rock from the pavement. Taking quick aim, she threw the rock as hard as she could, but groaned to see it fall well short of its target. The crows were completely unfazed. They were now well above the tallest trees in the neighborhood and climbing the highest flyers, growing hazy in the low-hanging clouds. The dark mass moved in an almost lazy pattern, stalling in motion before suddenly breaking in one direction and the next. Suddenly, the curtain of their bodies parted and Prue could see the distant beige shape of Mac. The cord jumper pulled in a grotesque ragdoll shape by the crow's talons. She could see one crow had a claw tangled on, his, on the down of his, fine, of his hair. Now the swarm would seem to split into two groups. One stayed surrounding the few crows who were carrying Mac, while the other dove away and skirted the treetops. Suddenly, Two of the crows let go of Mac's jumper, and the remaining birds scrambled to keep hold. Prue shrieked as she saw her brother slip from the claws and plummet. 
But before Mac even neared the ground, the second group of crows deftly flew, and he was caught, lost again to this cloud of squawking birds. Two more groups reunited, wheeled in the air once more, and suddenly, violently, shot westward, away from the playground. Determined to do something, Prue dashed to her bike, jumped up on, and gave pursuit. Unencumbered by Mac's red wagon, the bike quickly gained speed, and Prue darted down into the street. Two cars skidded to a stop in front of her and crossed the intersection in front of the library. Someone yelled, watch it, from the sidewalk. Prue did not dare take her eyes off the swimming, spinning crows in the distance. Her legs a blue blur over the petals. Prue blew the stop sign in Richmond and Ivanhoe, enticing an angered holler from a bystander. She then skidded through the turn southward of Will on Willamette. The crows, unhampered by the neighborhood's grid of houses, lawns, streets, and stoplights, made quick time over the landscape, and Prue commanded her legs to pedal faster to keep pace. In the chase, she could swear that the crows were toying with her, cutting back toward her, diving low and skirting the roofs to the houses, only to carve a great arc with a great push of speed and dart back to the west. In these moments, Prue could catch a glimpse of her captive brother, swinging in clutches of his captors, and then would disappear again, lost in the whirlwind of feathers. I'm coming for you, Mac, she yelled. Tears streamed down Prue's cheeks, but she couldn't tell if she cried them or if they were a product of the cold fall air that whipped at her face as she rode. Her heart was beating madly in her chest. Her emotions were stayed. She couldn't quite believe all this was happening. Her only thought was to retrieve her brother, so she swore she would never let him out of her sight again. The air was alive with car horns as Prue zigzagged through the steady traffic of St. John's. A garbage truck executing a slow traffic stalling Y-turn in the middle of Willamette Street blocked the road and Prue was forced to hop on the curb and barrel down the sidewalk. A group of pedestrians screamed and dove out of her way. Sorry, Prue shouted. In an angular motion, the, cr the crows doubled back, causing Prue to lay on the brakes, then dove into a low, almost single file and flew straight toward her. She screamed and ducked as the crows flew over her head and their feathers nicking at her scalp. She heard a distant gurgle and call, Hoo! And Mac, from Mac as they passed, and he was gone again. The crow is back on their journey westward. Prue pedaled the bike to speed and bunny hopped the wheels on the bike back onto the pavement of the street, grimacing as she absorbed the bumps with her arms. Seeing an opportunity, she took a hard right onto the side street and wound through the new development of identically whitewashed duplexes. The ground began to gently slope and her speed was gathering and the bike clattered and shaking beneath her. And then, suddenly, the street came to an abrupt end. She had arrived at the bluff. Here, at the eastern side of the Willamette River, was a natural border between the tight-knit community of St. John's and the riverbank. So, this is going to be Portland, Oregon. The three-mile length of the cliff simply called the bluff. Prue let out a cry and jammed on the brakes and nearly sending herself vaulting the handlebars over the edge. The, crew, the crows had clearly a precipice and were funneling skyward like a shivering black twister cloud. Ba framed by the rising smoke in the many smelters and smokestacks of industrial waves. There no veritable no man's land on the other side of the river long ago claimed by local industrial barons and transformed into a forbidding landscape of smoke and steel. Just beyond the wastes, through the haze, lay a rolling expanse of deeply forested hills, stretching out as far as the eye could see. The color drained from Prue's face. No, she whispered. In a flash of an instant, and without sound, the funnel of crows crested on the far side of the river and disappeared in a long, thin column into the darkness of these woods. Her brother had been taken to the impassable wilderness. Chapter 2 One City of Impassable Wilderness As long as Prue could remember, 
every map she had ever seen of Portland and the surrounding countryside had been blotted with a large, dark green patch in the center, stretching like a growth of moss on the northwestern corner to the southwest, and labeled the mysterious initials I.W. She had thought to ask about it until one night before Mac was born, when she was sitting with her parents in a living room. Her dad brought some home a new atlas, and they were laying on the recliner together, leafing through the pages and tracing their fingers over boundary lines and surrounding out the exotic place of the far-flung countries. When they arrived to a map of Oregon, Prue pointed to a small, inset map of Portland on the page and asked the question that had always confounded her. What's the IW? Nothing, honey, had been her father's reply. He flipped back to the map of Russia that they had been looking at moments before. With his finger, he traced over a circle of the wide northeastern part of the country where the letters of the word Siberia obscure, obscured the map. There were no city names here, no network of wandering yellow lines demarking highways and roads, only vast puddles in all shades of green and white and occasionally squiggly blue line linking to the myriad of remote lakes that peppered the landscape. There are places in the world where people just don't end up living. Maybe it's too cold, or there's too many trees, or the mountains are too steep to climb. But for whatever reason, no one has thought to build a road there without road. And without roads, there are no houses. And without houses, no cities. He flipped back to the map of Portland and tapped his finger against the spot where IW was written. It stands for Impassable Wilderness. And that's what it is. Why doesn't anyone live there? asked Prue. All the reasons why no one lives up in those parts of Russia. When the settlers first came to the area and started to build Portland, nobody wanted to build their houses there. The forest was too deep, the hills were too steep, and there were no houses there. So no one thought to build a road. And without roads and houses, the place just kind of sort of stayed that way, empty of people. The place, over time, just became more overgrown and more inhospitable. And so, he said, it was named the Impassable Wilderness, and everybody knew to steer clear. Her father dismissively wiped his hand across the map and brought it up to a gentle pinch of Prue's cheek, chin before his, with his thumb and finger, bringing her face close to his, and said, And I don't ever, ever want you to go in there. He playfully moved her head back and forth and smiled. You hear me, kid? Prue made a face and yanked her chin free. Yeah, I hear you. They both looked at the at back at the atlas, and Prue laid her head against her father's chest. I'm serious, said her father, and she could feel his chest tighten under her cheek. So Prue knew not to go near this impassable wilderness, and she only bothered her parents with questions about it again. But she couldn't ignore it. While they, they were downtown, continued to sprouting condominium buildings and newly minted terracotta outlet malls bloomed besi beside the highway in the suburbs, it baffled Prue that such an impressive swath of land should go unclaimed, untouched, undeveloped, right at the edge of the city. And yet, no adult ever seemed to comment or mention it was in, con in conversation. It seemed to not even exist in most people's minds. The only way that the impassable wilderness could crop up was among the kids at Prue's school. It was like where she was a seventh grader. There were an acrophorical tale where the older students about a man or so-and-so's uncle maybe who had wandered into the IW by mistake and had disappeared for years and years. His family, over time, forgot about him and continued on their lives until one day, out of the blue, he reappeared on their front doorstep. He didn't seem to have any memory of the intervening years, only to say that he'd been lost in the woods for some time and that he was terribly hungry. Prue had been suspicious from the story of first hearing it. The identity of this man seemed to change from storytelling to telling. It was someone's father in one version, a wayward cousin in another. Also, the details shifted in each telling. A visiting high school kid told a group of Prue's rap classmates that that the individual, in this version, the kid's older brother, had returned from its weirdly sojourn of the impassable wilderness, aged beyond belief, with a great white beard that stretched down to his tattered shoes. 
Regardless of the questionable truth of these stories, it became true clear to Prue that most of her classmates had similar conversations with their parents and she had had with her father. The subject of the wilderness had filtered into their place surreptitiously. What once was a poisonous lava around a four square court was now the impassable wilderness. And woe betide anyone who missed a bounce of forced up into a scurry after the red rubber ball into those wilds. In a game of tag, you were no longer tagged it, but you were designated the wild coyote of the IW. It was your job to scamper around where your fleeing classmates barking and growling. It was the specter of these coyotes that made Prue ask her parents a second time about the impassable wilderness. She had been wakened one night by a fright by the unmistakable sound of baying dogs. Sitting up in bed, she could hear Mac, then four months old, who had awoken as well and being quietly shushed by their parents as he wailed and whimpered in the next room. The dog's baying was a distant echo, but the bone-shivering nothingness. The tuneless melody of violence and chaos, and as it grew, more dogs in the neighborhood stuck, took up the cry. Prue noticed that the distant barking was different from the barking of the neighborhood dogs. It was more shrill, more disordered, angry. She threw her blanket aside and walked to, to her parents' room. The scene was eerie. Mac had quieted a little at this point, but she had been he was rocked in his mother's arms while their parents stood at the window, staring unblinking out and over the town in the distant western horizon, their faces pale and frightened. What's that sound? Prue asked, walking to the side of their parents. The lights of St. John's spread out before them, an array of flickering stars that had stopped at the river and dissolved into blackness. Her parents stared when she spoke, and her father just said, Oh, it's some old dogs howling. But farther away, asked Prue, it doesn't sound like dogs. Prue saw her parents share a glance, and her mother said, in the woods, darling, there are some pretty wild animals. That's probably a pack of coyotes wishing they could tear her into someone's garbage somewhere. Best not to worry about it, she smiled. The baying eventually stopped, and the neighborhood dogs calmed, and Prue's parents walked her back to her room and tucked her into bed. And that had been the last time the impassable wilderness had come up. But it hadn't put Prue's curiosity to, to rest. She couldn't help but feeling a little troubled. Her parents, normally two founts of strength and confidence, confidence, seemed strangely shaken by these noises. They seemed leery of a place as, uh, as Prue was. And so one can imagine Prue's horror when she witnessed the black plume of crows disappear, her baby brother in tow, into the darkness of this impassable wilderness. The afternoon had faded nearly completely, and the sun dipping down low into the hills of the wilderness, but Prue stood transfixed, slack-jawed, and at the edge of the bluff. The train engine trundled below her and rolled across the railroad bridge, passing low over the brick and metal buildings of the industrial waste. A breeze had picked up, and Prue shivered her beneath her peacoat. She was staring a little break, break in the tree line wherever the crows had disappeared. It started to rain. Prue felt like someone had bored a hole into the stomach the size of a basketball. Her brother was gone, literally captured by birds, carried to a remote, untouchable wilderness, and who knew what they would do to him there. And it was all her fault. The light changed from deep blue to dark gray, and the street lights slowly, one by one, began to click on. Night had fallen. Prue knew her vigil was hopeless. Mac would not be returning. Prue slowly turned her bike around and began walking it back up the street. How could she tell her parents? They would be devastated beyond belief, and Prue would be punished. She had been grounded before for staying out late on school nights, riding her bike around the neighborhood, but this punishment was certain to be nothing like she'd ever experienced. She'd lost Mac, her parents' only son, her brother, if a week of no television was the standard punishment for missing a couple curfews, she couldn't imagine what it was for losing baby brothers. She walked for several blocks in a trance and found she was choking back tears as, in her mind's eye, 
she witnessed anew the crow's disappearance into the woods. Get a grip, Prue, she said aloud, wiping tears from her cheeks. Think this through. She took a deep breath and began assembling her, her options in her mind, weighing each one's pros and cons. Going to the police was out. They'd undoubtedly think she was crazy. She didn't know what police did with crazy people who came into the station rambling, ram, ram, rambling about murders of crows and abducted one-year-olds. But she had her suspicions. She'd be carrying off, carried off into an armored van and thrown into some faraway asylum's subterranean cell, where she'd live out the rest of her days listening to the lamenting of her fellow inmates and trying hopelessly to convince her pa the passing janitor she was not crazy and she was falsely imprisoned there. Though the thought of rushing home to tell her parents terrified her, their hearts would be irrevocably broken. They had waited so long for Mac to come along. She didn't know her, the whole story, but she understood that they'd wanted to have a second child sooner, but that it just hadn't come about. They'd been so happy when they found out about Mac. They had been positively beamed. The entire house felt alive and light, so she couldn't be the one to break this terrible news to them. She could run away. This was a legitimate option. She could jump on the one of those trains going over the railroad bridge and split town and travel from city to city doing odd jobs and telling fortunes for a living. Maybe she'd even get one of the, a little golden retriever on the road who'd become her closest companion and they'd ramble the country together, a couple of gypsies on the run, and she'd never have to face her parents or think about her dear departed brother again. Prue stopped in the middle of the sidewalk and sh shook her head dolefully. What are you thinking? She reprimanded herself. You're out of your mind. She took a deep breath and kept walking, pushing her bike along, and a chill came over as she realized her only option. She had to go after him. She had to go into the impassable wilderness and find him. It seemed like an insurmountable task, but she had no choice. The rain had grown heavy and was pelting down on the sidewalks in the streets, making huge puddles, and the puddles became choked with flortillas of dead leaves. <clears throat> Prue devised a plan. Carefully gauging the dangers of such an adventure, the chill of evening draping over the rain-swept neighborhood streets, it would be unsafe to attempt this in the dead of night. I'll go tomorrow, she thought, unaware of that she was mumbling these words aloud. Tomorrow morning, first thing, mom and dad won't even have to know. But how to keep them from finding out? Her heart sank as she arrived at the scenes of Ma Mac's abduction, the playground. The play structure was abandoned in sheeting rain, and Mac's little red wagon sat on the asphalt, a heap of soggy blanket sitting inside, collecting water. That's it, said Prue, and she ran over to the wagon. Kneeling down on the wet pavement, she started to mold the sopping blanket and formed a swaddled baby. Standing back, she studied it. Plausible, she said, and she hadn't started. <coughs> she started to attach the wagon from the back axle of her bike, and she heard a voice call. A voice call. Hey, Prue. Prue stiffened to look over her shoulder. Standing on the sidewalk next to the playground was a boy, incognito, in a matching green slicker and pants. He pulled his hood back from his slicker and smiled. It's me, Curtis, he shouted and waved. Curtis was one of Prue's classmates. He lived with his parents and two sisters just down the street from Prue. Their desks at school were two rows apart, and Curtis was constantly getting into trouble with their teacher for spending school time drawing pictures of superheroes and various scrapes with the other arch enemies. His drawing obsession also tended to get him in trouble with his classmates, since most of the kids had abandoned superhero drawings years before, if they hadn't abandoned it altogether. Most kids devoted their drawing talent to sketching brand logos and paper bag covering of their textbooks. Prue was one of the only kids who had transitioned away from her superhero and fairy tale inspired renderings to drawings of birds and plants. Her classmates looked at askance at her, but they didn't dis they didn't bother her either. Curtis for clinging through his by by Curtis for clinging to his bygone art form was shunned. Hey Curtis, she said nonchalantly as possible. What are you doing? She put her, his hood back. I was just out for a walk and I was walking in the rain, less people around. 
He took off his glasses and pulled the corner of shirt from beneath the slicker to clean them. Curtis's face was round and topped by a mass of curly black hair that sprang from beneath his slicker hood and the little coils of still, like little coils of still wool. Why were you talking to yourself? Crew froze. What? You were talking to yourself. Just back there. He pointed into the direction of the bluff and squinted as he put his glasses back on. I was sort of following you, I guess. I meant to get your attention earlier, but you looked so distracted. I wasn't, was all that Prue could think to say. You were talking to yourself and walking and then stopping and shaking your head and doing all sorts of weird things, he said. And why were you standing on the bluff for so long? Just staring into space. Prue got serious. He walked her bike over to Curtis and pointed her finger into his face. Listen to me, Curtis, she said, commanding her most intimidating voice. I've got a lot on my mind, and I don't need you bothering me right now. Okay? To her relief, Curtis appeared to be easily intimidated. He threw up his hands and said, Okay, okay. I was just curious is all. Well, don't be. Just forget everything you saw. All right? She pushed her bike toward home, and she straddled the bike seat and pushed her feet into the toe clips. She turned to Curtis and said, I'm not crazy. And she rode off. And that's where we're going to end today. We get in, get to know two the two main characters. And I wonder what kind of adventures they get to have. You can see how thick this book is. You can see how many adventures they get to have. And I know for a fact I want to know each and every one of them. So that was Wildwood by Colin Malloy. All right. So we get to see that Pacific Northwest. All right. So I hope you have a good rest of your day. It was wonderful to see you and I will see you tomorrow. Bye.